for mathematics, statistics, and computer science. He frequently publishes on current economic issues in national newspapers. We are privileged to have published his book, Tracking the Indian Economy, a collection of articles in leading newspapers, which will immensely benefit the students and faculty in economics and business across the country and abroad. The book is available online on Amazon. The speaker this afternoon is Dr. Jagdi Shet. He is Charles H. Kellogg, Professor of Marketing at the Goizeta Business School, Emory University, Atlanta, and has been conferred with Padma Bhushan. He is known nationally and internationally for his scholarly contributions in consumer behavior, relationship marketing, competitive strategy, and geopolitical analysis. Professor Sheikh has over 55 years of combined experience in teaching and research at the University of Southern California and the University of Illinois, Columbia University, uh, world-renowned MIT and Emory University. He is also founder and chairman of Academy of Indian Marketing. Professor Sheikh has also served on the board of directors of several public companies, including Nostrum, Creo Cell International, and Wipro. He has been advisor and mentor to many CEOs and large corporations. He consistently figures in the list of Economic Times top 10 global thought leaders. Professor Sheikh is the recipient of all four top awards given by the American Marketing Association. These are the Richard D. Irwin Distinguished Marketing Educator Award. Number two, the Charles P. Coolidge Parlin Award. The P.D. Converse Award for Outstanding Contributions to Theory in Marketing. And uh, the fourth one, the William Wilkie Award for Marketing for a Better Society. Professor Sheth is a distinguished fellow of the Academy of Marketing Science, fellow of the American Psychological Association, and a recipient of a distinguished fellow award from the International Engineering Consortium. He has authored or co-authored over 300 articles and more than 30 books, including Clients for Life, The Rule of Three, The Self-Destructive Habits of Good Companies, techno te Tectonic Shift, Firms of Endearment, Chindia Rising, The Four Years of Marketing, Breakout Strategies for Emerging Markets, The Sustainability Edge. Uh, his most recent book is on genes, climate and consumption behavior connecting the dots. Professor Sheth is also a philanthropist who has contributed large sums to academia through Sheth Foundation and also supports AMA Sheth Foundation Doctoral Consortium through his foundation, which is managed by independent board members. Recently, he was conferred with honorary PhD by University of Illinois and also Shivanadar University. He is founder chairman of Academy of Indian Marketing. Recently, AACSB accredited IFIM Business School was named after Jackie Sheikh School of Management, a great honor. Dr. Jagdi Sheikh will address us on the topic, as you all know, India in the New World Order. He will speak for 30 minutes, followed by, followed by a Q&A session of 20 minutes. Distinguished participants are requested to type their questions in the chat box. It will be read out for answering. Following the Q&A, Professor Gangarajan will give his presidential address. Without much ado, I, I request Professor, J, Professor Jagdish to address the gathering. Professor Jagdish. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Mahinder Freddy. You can hear me okay, right? Yes, we are very clear. It is very clear. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me to deliver the ninth Vishesh Way Memorial Lecture. It is my honor. Uh, Professor Rangarajan, Mrs. Viseswe and the Vice Chancellor Reddy, I am very pleased to accept this honor and to deliver the lecture. I have attended ICFI many, many times before, and I've always enjoyed my presence there. The lectures I've given, but this is a very unique occasion. The topic is equally unique. Despite the COVID-19 coronavirus and its devastating impact on the economy of the world, including India, it may turn out to be in many ways acceleration of what I saw as a new triad power 
replacing the old triad power, both in economics, economy, military, and maybe politics. So I will give the journey about the old triad power, why the world order was very stable, how it has become very distable now, and in the process, surprisingly, India is becoming globally integrated geopolitically in a way we never thought about it. Now, what will it take for India to take advantage of this new opportunity is what I will talk about and ultimately conclude about kinds of places where India and the US alignment will take place. <clears throat> so here is the old world order. After World War II, which was very devastating, nations which were the victors, which is United States, United Kingdom, Russia to a part of that one, sat back together and created a new economic order, primarily by establishing three major institutions. You had the World Bank, you have, of course, the International Monetary Fund, and you also included, added the uh, United Nations, so that you have a consensus among nations and you don't go to war ever before. This was a whole dream and it turned out to be very true. So the old world order was established by 15 economies of the world. US and Canada is North American advanced economies. 12 nations of Western Europe, not the European Union as we know today, and the 12 nations were the traditional common market countries. And of course, a later entrant was Japan after World War II. So in 1987, 75% of the world GDP all was created by these 15 nations. The value add work on raw materials, value add work on humans in terms of service delivery and the, and the economic values you can create. 45% of the world trade was also within these 15 nations. Now why 45% is because many of these nations still had the old colonial relationships which were providing them raw materials agricultural raw materials, industrial raw materials. So they're still dependent on the raw materials rather than have raw materials within their own nations. But all of them are aging and aging very rapidly. Japan is the oldest nation in this consortium of 15 nations. Every month there'll be fewer Japanese than the last month, there's nothing they can do. Germany right now is zero population, as many deaths as births, for example, and India, I mean, America also is aging. Our birth rate is below replacement rate. It is still growing 1.6 children per woman as opposed to negative growth, but it is likely to also become an aging nation. In fact, in the US, the baby boomers, as we call them, which are all retirees now, so we have 10,000 retirees per day for the next two decades. So India and America also is likely to be the age aging nations. By the way, that is true of most of the Western European countries in general. This world order was well established. Balance of power was created between communism and capitalism. Cold War was the common front that united all these Western nations by and large. There was a harmonious economic, military, and political relationship, as I mentioned before, and IMF, World Bank and the United Nations became overarching transnational agencies. What has changed the world order? First of all, the bigger event has been collapse of communism. In 1989 to 1991, whatever date you would like, communism collapsed. There was a huge Soviet bloc as an economy, we used to call Comic-Con economies, pretty large sector of the economy Unfortunately, not high growth because they had a basically a socialistic or a communist philosophy, like the license Raj in India at that time, that collapsed. It created many, many nations which began to lean toward becoming free capitalistic countries. Poland would be a good example. Czech and Slovak would be another good example. Many of the common, you know, the communist nations by and large the biggest one is very interesting. Most of those nations went through a political change where there was a revolt against communism. Opposition party came and there was a transition time period. Some of them made it very well. Only nation that has done very well transitioning from cap communism to capitalism has been China. 
All they did was very simple, change the manifesto of the party. Rather than being driven by communism ideology or Leninist thinking, they began to think about capitalism as new party remains the same, which has been a very smooth transition. And because of the political stability, the nation has risen very fast in the process. We also have smartphones and social media. There's a bigger change than ever imagined possible, especially in emerging markets like India, China, and definitely Africa now. So smartphones and social media have brought about a significant change from 1987. As I mentioned, rapid aging of the advanced economies in general, which is creating its own toll in terms of social programs, health programs, pension plans, etc. I will just mention around here that at one time at General Motors, which was the largest corporation, 1 million employees, with all the suppliers adding additional maybe two and a half, three million people, they have believed that there'll be no change in the growth of automotive industry. And therefore, for every one retiree, there'll be eight or nine new workers who will contribute toward the pension plan. So the pension plans will be always a surplus. The reality today is that for eight retirees, there's only one worker who contributes toward the pension plan. Not sustainable, you have to go for chapter 11 bankruptcy. Most of it is automated. What you have is robots primarily, and robots do not pay toward the pension plan, for example. Labor is displaced by capital in this particular case. A nations are aging, creating enormous social burden, and the social contract, whether it's for airlines or any large enterprise, and ultimately the government, we have a lot of debate whether in the United States, social security system, which is our pension system, with the aging of the population is sustainable. We created a new trade regime, WTO, abolishing the old GATT agreement, general agreement on tariff and trade. And that was because in the 90s, to create any economic growth, you had to go for trade as a mechanism as opposed to investment or domestic growth by and large. Uh, new leaders came in place. And these leaders are very different in their thinking. They're not the traditional politicians as we know. For example, we have Xi Jinping in China, Donald Trump in, in America, and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. They're very different in their thinking about what the new world order should be like. So I will just add around here, is the new world a new world order or is it a disorder? First of all, it's a major disorder because China has arisen as a significant economic superpower. And I'll show you some numbers which you cannot see on the screen, but I'll talk about it. Surprisingly, if you measure on a purchasing power parity basis, GDP, China is already ahead significantly uh, from America and the growth rate is much faster than America. And therefore there is no way US can catch up. So it is becoming a major counterbalancing force, not on ideology as was the case with Soviet Union, but much more on economic and military power just like rise of America in one some, some sense. We have a discord among traditional allies and alliances. NATO does not know what it wants to do. American government has pulled out of WHO, for example, despite the coronavirus. Any of the traditional alliances created after World War II, including the agencies, are suddenly finding that they don't seem to have a consensus about what the world should look like. Populism everywhere. In fact, today on television, there is nothing but protest in countries after countries, always asking for reforms, not happy with the current politicians or the political parties, for example. In many countries, somebody who was never known becomes a leader through elected process, creates a party after election even sometimes, and that is true in most countries that we know right now, going through a significant change through the democratic process but bringing about an uncertainty in the economics and the politics of the nation. World is definitely moving toward Asia-centric pivot, both in terms of economics and military. So right now you see South China Sea counterbalancing force created by what is known as the squad, which is Australia, Japan, India, and America as counterbalancing the military to make sure that the waterways in the Asian theater are safe, commerce can continue, rather than having a foreign power dictate everything in that area pretty much. 
very fascinating change, and I'll talk about that a little more. There's a rise of the new middle class in all of the emerging economies. In most emerging economies, about 60% of all consumption is unbranded products, mostly bought through informal distribution systems or informal economy. Today, more and more people want branded products. Rather than do it yourself, they would like to buy commercially made products and also buy from organized retailing. This is creating a massive opportunity in consumer markets compared to what we ever thought was possible in the 80s, for example. And India has clearly shown that since the economic reforms in 1991, the choices today I have in automobiles, motorcycles, scooters, watches, any product you look at it, there's absolutely no comparison in the license Raj days versus the 1991 economic reforms and choices I can have in India today, easily accessible, world-class brands made in India or made outside of India. We have a very significant political and social acrimony globally. Today, world leaders are communicating through Twitter, creating enormous anxiety in the public about what they are thinking about, why they are thinking it, rather than having a discourse in the background and only announcing the ultimate results. This is a dialogue with a population of popular vote because of the huge power of the popular vote. And I think this is creating a huge acrimony in the, in the public domain. And of course, capital markets are in turmoil. The traditional definition of capital markets also is going away, such as the debt market, for example, or the public equity market. More and more, we see the dominance, in fact, of surprisingly equity mark, private equity market. And within private equity, I've been very astounded to see the numbers. Largest wealth today is not a sovereign wealth or foundation wealth, but personal wealth. Last year, it exceeded $160 trillion, trillion dollars. We have 20 million millionaires worldwide. And we have more than 2,000 billionaires. There is even a speculation that Jeff Bezos, Amazon founder, probably will be the first who will have trillion dollars of personal assets, not company assets. And the question, therefore, is that these private wealth people what do they do with their personal wealth? Will they contribute back to the society? Because if I take $160 trillion of wealth and just think about earning 10% return through alternate investment strategies, a portfolio, I am earning $16 trillion compounding over that over time. I'm bigger than any nation's GDP. There's a very significant change. More recently, it has happened from the 80s onwards, essentially, more and more private wealth accumulation has been enormous. So the Gini score that we talk about, which is the lowest income to the highest income, has to be replaced about the Gini scores on wealth. So what's the new world order? The new world order actually is going to be United States still continues the journey. China emerges as another second power and India. Everybody's surprised why India, why not Germany, why not European Union? Why not Japan continue? And that is because if you take the purchasing power parity data from IMF in this particular case, in 2020, China just exceeded $28 trillion and growing back again after uh, COVID-19 impact on the economy, mostly on the domestic growth. US is about $20 trillion. India is about 11 trillion. And then it drops suddenly so Japan is 5.45 trillion, Russia is 4 trillion, Germany is 4 trillion, Indonesia is 3.78, coming up a little faster. Brazil is 3.3, but stagnating right now. UK is 2.98. Rest of them are around $3 trillion. So India is already the third largest economy measured by PPP measures, which I like more so than the traditional way of calculating GDP. Now, where are they coming from? The largest growth markets in the new true triad power nations, China and India is consumer markets. Consumer markets are growing enormously because of the change from unbranded products through unorganized sector to branded products through organized retailing, including e-commerce, for example, like the Flipkart in India, 
Amazon in India, for example. Yeah. And now you see a big change happening where Reliance Geo is likely to become one of the largest retailers, very similar in fact to what happened in Alibaba, for example, in China. And the IPO today, the aunt is going to create aunt holdings is one of the largest IPOs, bigger than Saudi Arabia's Aramco offering that happened last year. So India, China and America relationship will become very key in the process. Consumer markets is one major growth engine. Infrastructure is another one, very big one, including in the US because we have so much of deferred maintenance and our bridges and the roads are all aging. Our airports are aging and they can be all modernized, very big one. And that's a big area of growth. Defense, very major area of growth of defense in all three nations, including India. And defense and security will drive the future relationships. Now, US and China have a negative relationship. In fact, I have a paper I just finished writing as a policy document, Cold War 2.0, as opposed to Cold War 2. The new Cold War 2.0 will be between China and America, not based upon ideology, which was the first Cold War, but based on technology. Very key difference is coming about so there's a race for technology among these two nations, which is going to impact the rest of the world. India and America now has a positive relationship. If you go back to the early days of India's independence, we were the leader in the non-alignment movement. We did not want to align either with the communist bloc or with the uh, capitalistic bloc primarily or the allies, but actually we were non-aligned in the process. The relationship was never same between US and India, but today it is very positive. You saw two plus two meeting where the defense minister and the diplomatic minister, secretary of state comes to India, meets with our defense minister and our in fact, uh, foreign affairs minister and two plus two have a joint meeting art, art, architecting the future relationship between on a diplomatic basis and on the military basis between India and America. Relationship between India and China at one time was emerging positive. I wrote a book called Chindia Rising, that China and India together as two economies and rising economies probably will transform the global economy. But today, very clearly, India is distancing from China. It's a negative relationship. So in this trilateral relationship, India is becoming more strategic for China, for its interest, and definitely US needs India very badly today than ever before. Surprisingly, one more player involved, which will be very key to understand would be Russia. Russia worldwide is also becoming very strategic, especially in the European theater and the Middle East theater. And as I mentioned, this is all because of the large emergence of consumer organized markets and branded products, infrastructure such as airports, seaports in India, for example, would be quite a lot. So let me go to the areas where India, what can India do? Both China and the US consider India to be strategic for their future. Uh, what I find is India has all the ingredients, but needs a recipe. We are very blessed with many things. In fact, uh, I can tell you what we are. Big consumer market, as I mentioned, like cell phone market, we are number two. Smartphone, we are number one in growth defense, infrastructure investment opportunities. Digital talent. This is very large scale digital talent, which says that if the, the uh, immigration policies are shifting because of populism, America doesn't allow as many immigrants. European Union is very slow. So the workers cannot come to the place. So the work has to go to where workers are. And you see massive therefore, buying or recruiting of employees in India by all of the foreign multinationals in IT services. Accenture, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, they're all growing primarily in this case, in this case in Hyderabad, it turns out to be as opposed to any other city. Digital talent in India. In India. So my view is that what India has is a gold mine of talent. And therefore, if you want to have gold, you have to come to India which is a very interesting interdependence from all over the world. 
Very significant asset India has is global diaspora. Indian diaspora has done very, very well all over the world, whether it's in science, whether it's in uh, leadership at academic universities. You see the announcement after announcement why top universities, business school deans are of Indian origin. All the large corporations, CEOs are now of Indian origin. They're doing very well in the politics of the nations, both in the United Kingdom, Canada, and definitely in America. And the journey has just begun that it's a great, great ingredient that India can leverage. We also have a growing soft power. The world begins to understand India not as a country of roaming cows and snake charmers, which was the old image in propaganda, but today people admire what India is capable of doing, not only historical civilization, but the new India essentially in terms of technology, very talented people, people doing very, very well in terms of productivity, how will you measure them? Strong military power, surprising to many parts of the world, India is a strong military power also. And last and the most important one is that Indians, both in India and abroad, now have a positive self-image. I can do it. During the license Raj, there was always this helplessness. I have all the talent. My family wants to invest with me, but there are no opportunities. Today, there are opportunities in India. We can create, of course, unicorn companies, as Bangalore has shown, Gurgaon near you know, Delhi NCR has shown. We have the rise of entrepreneurship in a technology field, but also in non-technology like consumer packaged goods. So to me, positive self-image is a real, real change that has taken. It's a great thing to do. What it needs, the recipe is primarily to reposition India from a restricted domestic economy as the focus from a policy viewpoint and market viewpoint, become more and more integrated global economy and from a low tech approach generally, like our farming. Farming is the same as thousands of years old. We have not shifted to modern farming, for example. Most advanced countries, if you look at their history, including America, shifted the farming to modern farming or from what I call low tech to high tech. And today high tech is more affordable than ever before in the digital age. So what can India do? First of all, several recommendations. One very key one is embrace global standards and global benchmarks for domestic products and services. There's a huge quality difference. So either by market processes or by policy, more likely by policy, we have to benchmark and we have to raise the standards as Japan did, which was a laughing stock as low quality producer in the world. They put the policy documents as a South Korea done very well in transition. China is doing very well right now. And we can do it the same way. So embrace global standards in every field that we have, that will be very key. Whether it's in automotive components, pharmaceuticals, processed foods, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Become a second global sourcing destination. World wants to de-risk from China even after the post COVID. The control of China on every product, mundane products like toys, microwave ovens, to more technology products, people are saying I cannot depend on it because there's a whole trust factor about the rise of China itself. So people would like an alternate sourcing place wherever they are and India has a very large opportunity. Become a global hub for technical talent. India is very capable of providing to world R&D services at very affordable cost. So it's very possible that people don't have to come to India for low wage like call centers or BPOs. Why we settle for $25, $35 per hour income or a revenue, why not go for $90, $200? It's very possible. We have the talent pool to do it. It's a question of properly guiding that market. So IT services, accounting and legal services, and today publishing industry. Most of the academic journals by top, top publishers are all basically done in India uh, within the same company. So rather than outsourcing, you see more and more insourcing. Oracle probably will have a building ready in Hyderabad this year or next year, 
1.2 million square feet, large number of employees will be working for Oracle in India. IBM, I think India is the third largest employer, will surpass Japan pretty soon as the momentum comes around here. Ernst & Young accounting firm already has like 50,000 employees in Hyderabad in one location alone, that's what I was told. So it is not just the Indian IT services or Indian legal services or Indian accounting services. It is the world services who will come to India because this is where the talent or the manpower is, et cetera. Gain soft power through globally admired brands. I think the soft power theory that we invented in the old days of the military and ideological basis can shift toward the modern approach. Nations get admired because of the brands and the products and the quality they make. Germans have a reputation. US used to have a reputation, by the way, not anymore as much. Japan still has a reputation. South Korean brands like Samsung, Hyundai, LG are all dominating world, not just India or South Korea. And of course, China has all quality products today. But China, made in China also is rising in its image. Let me quickly summarize a couple of points and then open up for Q&A. Speed up the digital infrastructure. I've been advocating that since the 90s. I worked quite a lot in the telecom industry. I have a center for the telephone industry. There is nothing like embracing the digital technology for transparency, for record keeping. There's a massive, massive opportunity to reduce fraud, reduce corruption in the process. So 5G is an initiative. India Stack is a major initiative. India is doing quite well. Other, there is nothing like other platform in the world. No other country has been able to achieve 1.3 billion biometric. And so far, at least in public domain, we don't know there has been any hacking, which is very secure data. And of course, we provide more rural reach today, let's say through Reliance Geo, uh, 4G architecture, however we do it, than most of the nations. Must invite foreign investment in India for global markets. I think those days of thinking about protecting our market from foreign investment are gone. 1991 reforms clearly shown that inviting them in a positive way, you can have world-class brands made in India as Whirlpool has done in appliances, LG Industries has done, uh, Toyota has done, for example, uh, German car makers have done. And there's nothing like saying that they take the control, that's not the case. The world has changed enormously. So I'm very strongly of the advocate that in the automobile industry, where in the small cars, we still have a lot of power, pharmaceuticals, defense services, having private sector, have a defense sector, just like we have it in the rest of the world, in US or UK, for example. And, but make the products not only for India market, but for the world market. Provide huge economic incentives for innovation and entrepreneurship, my next recommendation, which we are doing it with a new, national education policy, new national research fund, fund I think, like an NSF we have, a similar one. I think all of those are coming uh, in a significant way, but this requires a lot more. In India, one of the biggest things I find fascinating is that our large corporations do not have world-class R&D of their own. Doesn't matter who you are or how big you are. We seem to have skipped the R&D phase and go directly into manufacturing based on licensed technology and having the trading house mentality, not a manufacturing mentality. And that needs to be done, in my view, in a significant way by government giving incentives to have R&D labs like IBM labs, Bell Labs, where I did advising quite a lot, that are world-class and they compete with academic institutions for Nobel prizes in science, in technology, et cetera. Digitize, 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 as I mentioned. Data is the new oil. We need greater transparency in all over the world, and this will deliver through digitization and accountability. Surprisingly, contrary to people's belief, automation does not replace humans. It amplifies them, makes them go from the low wage to a higher wage economy. For example, the worst amount of labor in terms of Hard work is agriculture. Agriculture moves to industrial side. Industrial wages are commanded better and also working conditions are better in the industrial age 
if you now go to the digital age, it's even more. So I'm a very strong advocate that we must digitize and actually enhance the human capital. So I'll just give an example. Today, automobiles are more like computers. I'm not talking about autonomous driving even. It's basically computerized machine. Largest cost in building an automobile today are chips and software, not the metal like steel. It's a very smart machine. To do just the maintenance on that machine, you need a smart technician. It's not a traditional one who will change oil and all the stuff, smart technician you need. His wages are much higher in the process. He has to use a technology, a testing machine or whatever it is. Here is another key example. If you take a software engineer, 10 plus two plus three out of let's say Bangalore, and he joins one of the IT services companies, his wages are about 50,000 or 60,000 per month. But at the end of the month, he has no cash flow because he pays his rent as a paying guest, about 20,000 rupees in Bangalore. He actually, in fact, uh, surprisingly has modern habits, has a girlfriend or a boyfriend, whatever they are. They believe in going to the nightclubs. Spending behavior is more discretionary as opposed to necessity. At the end of the month, they have no cash flow. Compare that to a crane operator in India, in Kutch Mundra port. He commands, by the way, 90,000 rupees per month salary. Typically married, high school educated, but technically vocationally trained. Has a wife. Wife is taking care of the aging parents, raises the family. He does not pay any rent, stays with his parents. His discretionary income is much greater than the software engineer. This is a clear change in the reality of the world in India itself that we need to recognize. So vocational technical training can actually increase significantly the human capital value. I'm a very strong believer that since our most of the government workers come from the IS examinations or Indian foreign service examination or Indian police service examinations, they really do not have formal management education. They all have academies, but academies do not have comparable to what we would call an MBA equivalent knowledge. My view is that it needs to be mandated. Today, running a government enterprise or running a government bureau is business. Ultimately, you cannot just learn on the job. You need some formal understanding about economics or human capital or finance or whatever it is and marketing, especially in my view. I think that's very important. And we need to deepen our diplomatic relationship with G7 nation. They still will be very, very important ones as opposed to other nations, both on a personal and a professional basis. And this is where you see leaders vary enormously. Some leaders are very good about not only having a professional relationship, but personal relationship. And I think in that regard, uh, Prime Minister Modi rises above most of the ministers in the world, leaders of the world, in terms of having personal professional relationship. So here is a person who is equally comfortable with Putin, who is a very different personality, Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron in France, Canada's young guy, for example, US presidents very different from Obama to, for example, Trump. It's very interesting to see. And of course, in Asia with uh, uh, Abe, which is a Jap Japanese leader who has just stepped down. I think that's very important that the leaders at the top really are very comfortable with the world the diversity of opinions and the leaders and can still have a very strong personal relationship. So let me close this presentation by saying there's a new geopolitical order. The traditional leaders and institutions are struggling to maintain the world order, as we can see today on the news. This has generated opportunity for new leadership. India is, to, is destined to become strategic globally. And I think I have one more page. I didn't wanna show the slides because it's better to have a dialogue more informally. India has the in, in, uh, enviable ingredients but needs a recipe to take advantage of the new world order. Repositioning India from a restricted domestic economy to a globally integrated economy. And more importantly, 
actually transforming from a low tech economy to high tech, like almost like a discontinuous change as we are done with the cell phones, as we are doing with the cloud computing. Can we put smartness into everything we do? Agriculture, as I mentioned earlier, to factories, for example, to services economies where the technology is embedded to a level where it becomes much more productive as well as much more capable of doing things that it could not do without the technology. And I think that's where the India's future is. I'm very optimistic, despite the COVID downturn right now, India will come back in a very significant way starting in the new decade. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so we'll have uh, questions. Uh, uh, I, I have uh, received a couple of questions to start with. Uh, <clears throat> sir, uh, th there are a couple of questions. Uh, sure. Well, first, uh, f there are uh, two questions which are very similar. One is, uh, <clears throat> when and how will India become a superpower? Number two. Yes. India has many positives, as you have just now mentioned, a large domestic market, uh, uh, digital talent, gold mine of talent, uh, young demographics, abundant labor supply at reasonable cost, proximity to Asia, and a sense of historical greatness. But it is also said that uh, 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 how can it leverage on the positives? And then there are negatives. Poverty, still a problem. Unemployment, serious problem, underemployment. Market inequalities in the distribution of income and environmental concerns still dominate the scene. So uh, how can it leverage on its positives to have a bigger role in the world? And it is said that 21st century belongs to India. Is this true? Um, the 21st century belongs to India, not necessarily in terms of becoming the superpower, there are two other contenders and India does not need to contend as the most dominant global power. It just can be a good economic power and a good, uh, I would say, military power. It can be achieved despite all the problems because if you look at the history of America 150 years ago, at the time of Abraham Lincoln, it was probably the worst, worst place to be before civil war. There's a huge debate going on primarily using the African-American as slaves, and you have the slave-based economy, mostly agricultural. After Lincoln policy was implemented, it reformed into an industrial state. First thing to do was to make sure you create a middle class. That was very important. Make sure you invest in education, which is what America did. So if you look at the rise of America, if you look at the rise of China in the last 35, 40 years, which is a living history for people like us who have lived through the transformation, same formula. Create organized markets, create branded products. As I mentioned in India today, there's a strong unorganized sector even today for whatever reason, invest in agriculture, modernize agriculture as America did, which led to invention of all of the agricultural equipment but also processes. So that's very important that we need to think through looking at examples of other economies and how they transform to become economic powers. You do, I do agree that India has more challenges because we are a federation. We are more diverse than European Union and therefore it's a problem in terms of trying to get the unity going in diversity. There'll be uneven economic growth, et cetera, pretty much. Okay. I cannot hear you. Am I audible? Now, now you're audible, yes. You have mentioned about the national education policy 2020. Can yes. India become a hub for quality higher education in the world? Similarly, in health services, can India become a global destination in view of cost advantage? Uh, okay, two things. First of all, the new national education policy 
will definitely attract top universities from the world. Again, the benchmarking will shift from our domestic uh, compliance, our domestic accreditations, domestic ratings in business, newspaper, uh, et cetera. It's very interesting that we go for global accreditation, global everything. So I think clearly, and attracting the foreign companies coming in, the foreign universities, I think Harvard is already invited, Yale is already invited, and they, are, they will be more transformative than what we do in education, that's clearly one. If they come here, here is the advantage of why bringing foreign universities. India sends out about 1 million students a year abroad, mostly going to five countries. And those students who go abroad are spending between four to $5 billion, which is a huge foreign exchange drain. And they're paying more price when they go as non-resident as foreign students. So in, for example, state universities, like Georgia Tech or University of Illinois, which are top, top engineering schools, the residents pay about half the price, foreign students pay double the price. So foreign students subsidize the local. This reverses the flow by and large. This creates an enormous opportunity for Indian talent to grow on a global basis rather than just on a local basis. Now services sector, Make in India policy, which was designed for manufacturing, actually is happening in the services sector. The world is coming to India. Hyderabad is a key city, surprisingly, actually just for that reason. Everybody's investing in India because yeah. in services, we have the talented people and in services, we can do quite a lot. So services hub will be very clearly the one that will happen much sooner than the manufacturing hubs. Yeah. The next question. I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. Yeah, uh, no. yeah. Uh, are you able to hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now, yes. Uh, can you, uh, how much do you think investment in social equality and social justice across the population is important for India in the 21st century? Yeah, it's very interesting. Surprisingly, India is the only country who has mandatory 2% tax on income of all private limited and public limited companies and the state enterprises. No other nation has been able to do that. So we have a dramatic approach to doing things. We are watching as a living experiment that if the self-made millionaires do not contribute back to the society, there will be something about their wealth that has to be used positively for the society. I'm a very strong believer and I have books written, I just wrote an article that the business of business is more than business. If you look at historically, the rise of industry in America, an entrepreneurial family went to a small town because it had the raw material advantages near where the raw materials were the community gave them access to a river or lake or whatever it is, and community nurtured them. If those companies are still headquartered in small town, they are not driven by shareholder obsession, shareholder value. Shareholder is not the only stakeholder. In fact, I learned that from Whirlpool Corporation as an advisor in a small town called Benton Harbor, Michigan, everybody knows everybody. There's a great equalizer, the best well-known family who creates the town has to go to church every Sunday. There's a belief that God is above us, for example. We have to behave properly. Your managers are your neighbors. Their children play with your children or grandchildren. So you know them informally as opposed to just formally. As it happens on campus towns, in many places where faculty live next to each other, whether you are a chancellor or a vice chancellor, you are not in a gated community. Biggest problem in America happened when large corporations, listed companies, shifted their headquarters from small towns, like General Electric from a small place in upstate New York goes to New York City, capital markets. So the only stakeholder you see day in, day out is the investor and the analyst. Whereas in a small town headquarters like Caterpillar in Peoria, Illinois, 
Kohler in a whole town built called Kohler, for example, in Wisconsin. They are living with the community. They are part of the community, so they worry about their employees, suppliers especially. They worry strongly about their suppliers because suppliers came there because of their blessings. They worry about the environment in the community. So, so long as the next generation does not move to larger metropolitan areas, it seems to have that culture of more a stakeholder driven corporation. So I've, I'm a strong believer, contrary to economic thinking, that the business of business is more than business, period. And there's a book out we have written called The Forms of Endearment, which has shown conclusively that companies that are stakeholder oriented actually perform better financially than companies that are strictly shareholder driven. So it seems like shareholder driven obsession is only the phenomenon from the 80s since capital markets began to encourage or move the founders of the companies or their children to move to capital market. True in India, same thing. Uh, sir, uh, there is one more question on the, on the National Education Policy 2020. Sure. Do you think the National Education Policy 2020 will provide a strong ecosystem to develop a competitive and quality human capital? Uh, the answer is yes, definitely, for two or three reasons. First of all, in management education alone, where we are all primarily involved, there is no need for 4,000 business schools, please. Most of them are strictly on paper. They don't even have physical infrastructure. They don't have students. I think let market process weed them out. They don't, they don't deserve to be given the license. If you use now technology, such as online education, in my three campuses or five campuses, I can have one professor take care of five campuses, so I release the capacity in the process. There's a big worry about India does, has a shortage of faculty. Technology actually increases the capacity out of nowhere within like three months. We all went under COVID phenomenon, teaching in person in classroom to online. I am, Bangalore has, has told me that in 2020, they already had 1 million students in management alone. That's unthinkable because they went onto the digital platform besides teaching in the classroom, expanded the market. So I think it's very possible. In the eighties, I was thinking about and involved in bringing students from emerging economies, especially Africa, who were not willing to go to United Kingdom or United States because of the cost of living, et cetera, to come to India. United Nations was very interested in India becoming the global hub for other developing economies because we were far ahead of them, especially in education. So yes, there is a possibility in many ways, but online education is very important. It'll be transformative. What is peripheral right now, which is online, will become core what is core, which is in-person will become uh, peripheral essentially. And I, I know we are all debating right now, I'm teaching online class using Zoom technology, for example, and a Canvas platform. Faculty were the most resistant. All content is on the laptop. Library is today in the laptop. Physical space, we don't need to build the infrastructure, which is expensive capital, obviously unless you are making money out of that real estate that you do like a hotel does. That's a different story. But from an education viewpoint, online is absolutely critical for the future of India. Uh, sir, I, I just like to make one observation before I go to the last question. Uh, you'll be very happy to know that at ICFI Foundation for Higher Education, last uh, uh, four, five months we have been conducting all the classes online, all the seminars right. online, all the meetings right. online. Right, exactly. Now the, exactly. Last, the last question, sir, is should India adopt more marketing and branding techniques to improve its competitive position in the world? Answer is yes, yes, yes. And the reason is Peter Drucker. Probably the best management thinker of the last century was Peter Drucker. And he came out with four or five things, all marketing. Uh, one was that the purpose of business is to acquire and retain customers, not profit. 
Second thing he said is that the two most value add functions in a corporations are innovation and marketing. We respect innovation, we admire innovation, we invest innovation, but we look down on marketing. A great innovation without good marketing is a failure. A good innovation needs good marketing, period. This debate about marketing, and that's because of our legacy, all cultures in the world associate marketing with selling and with traders, and they are looked down in the Western world, like Shakespeare plays, you can see, they're definitely looked down in our culture. Trading community is not a respected community, for example. So I think we are associating marketing wrongly with selling. Once we disassociate that, and innovation is focused on the user, not on the buyer. Marketing also should be focused on user, not on the buyer. Buyer is a sales guy who should be focused on the buyer and seller. I think once we understand properly, we have to create a positive image about marketing itself as a discipline, which is not the case. I must tell you, in social sciences alone, marketing is looked down as a discipline. Although if you look at the latest Nobel Prize winners, kinds of experiments that they did to reduce poverty, the young couple, that's exactly the kind of market research we have done all over the world under four foundation grants doing the same thing. But because it's done by a marketing professor, nobody knows it or even wants to acknowledge it. So marketing has a marketing problem, as a discipline. Thank you, Innovation sir. doesn't have that problem, okay? So, so that's what we need to do. Thanks. I can go on and on forever, but I want to slow down. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll stop here. There are a few more questions. But thank you, sir, for your, uh, for your excellent lecture and the uh, way in which you have answered so many questions. Uh, now, uh, thank you very much. Very uh, interesting and in-depth analysis of India's position in the world. Now, I request Professor Rangarajan to give the presidential remarks. Professor Rangarajan. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. We can okay. hear. Right. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, friends, uh, this is a day of uh, remembrance. Uh, this is a day on which we should remember uh, the contributions Mr. Professor Isaswi made uh, towards the cause of uh, education. Uh, he was a brilliant uh, teacher. He was an outstanding scholar. Besides, he was also an eminent educationist who helped to establish a series of ICFI institutions which are held in high esteem now because of the foundation that he laid. Uh, the biggest way in which we can repay uh, our gratitude to him is by maintaining the high quality of these institutions. I want to thank most sincerely Professor Seth for accepting our invitation uh, to be with us at virtually this evening and to, and to have delivered a very insightful lecture. Professor Seth is well known for his contributions in the field of marketing. Highly respected all over the world for the contributions he has made. But today, he really took on a subject which is more broad-based and went into it in a manner in which that we can all appreciate the points that he has made and has also made us think about some of the issues that he has raised in the course of his lecture. 
where will india be in the new world order where do we aspire to be in the new world order will we be able to achieve really a high position in this new world order i do find professor seth very optimistic he essentially made the point that india will be probably one among the three powers that may steer the course of the world uh, in the coming decades obviously there are other countries but he did point out about the prominence that india could achieve or might achieve the new world order has also several problems he described about some of the features of the new world order in the beginning of this millennium in the first decade of the 21st century many people were optimistic india was on the high growth path but in 2005 6 and 2007 8 india's average growth rate was 9% the united states was also growing fast but at the end of the decade there was a turning point the western nations faced the 2008 9 crisis and in india post 2010 11 the growth rate started falling in fact the pandemic the covid-19 pandemic came on top of a situation in which the world economy was declining and also the indian growth rate was also declining what will be the shape of the new world order will we be able to bring spring back into high growth path leave aside india i will come to india a little later but will the western world be able to to do it there is not that much optimism about the growth path of many of the developed countries yes i agree with professor say technology is bringing about a big change there are fundamental changes that are continuing to happen but what the impact of those changes is also not very clear because the artificial intelligence the impact of that is probably going to be very different from the impact of the changes in the technology that 18th or the 19th or the early 20 or the 20th century saw and people even now are talking about the four day week instead of a five day week and what impact it will have on employment is also not very clear and in fact as he mentioned that the number of billionaires and the number of people who have amassed great wealth is increasing but that is also the problem that the world and the western world is seeing the distribution of income has become a critical issue at this particular point capitalism gained much acceptance in the post second world war period because capitalism was accompanied by an expansion of the economy in which everybody was able to become part of it but to some extent what is happening now is even where growth is happening it is getting concentrated and the level of employment uh, is not picking up as fast as it can be and in fact in the post 2008 9 crisis one had almost seen in some of the countries like spain and so on and so forth where the level of unemployment was almost going back to the 1930s therefore the world is changing the world is experiencing are the benefits of new technology but at the same time the system is also operating in a manner in which 
not all are getting the benefit of the same. Will these economies again pick up? Therefore, there is a problem as far as the developed economies are concerned. Now come back to the emerging economies. The great optimism that prevailed in India in the first decade after the millennium is somewhat evaporated. As Cleopatra said, oh me, the vision has vanished. The music has died away. In fact, from 2010-11, it has been steadily falling. And a, a rate of growth of 4.2%. This is before the pandemic. It's something that was happening before 1991. I can tell you because I was one of the part of the team which sought to bring about the changes that 1991 saw. We essentially took the various steps in order to bring about the big change. But actually, these changes are important. We must continue to make those changes. I think reform agenda must continue to be an integral part of our economic program. But we really need to get back to the high growth path. In fact, I would agree with him that India has the potential to be a part of the triad that you mentioned. But the ability to be a superpower yeah. is extremely dependent upon India being a strong economic power. Yeah. Without the strong being a strong economic power, it cannot become a strong political participant in this world. Yeah. In some sense, we need to recapture the vision that existed in the early 1990s, the vision that existed in the first decade of the, uh, of the, of the millennium. There have been many studies, I have also written a lot on this, of the factors that might have contributed to the decline in the growth rate of the Indian economy. It is very clear that all calculations show that India will not be a dominant power unless we grow at the rate of 8% per annum for a decade and more. Professor Seth mentioned about the fact that on a purchasing power parity basis, India is perhaps among the top three countries. But that is not the only indicator. But if you measure it in terms of the per capita income, India is nowhere near the top. India has, is well below many, many other countries in the world. Therefore, the strength of the nation not only depends upon the total value of the output, but also the per capita um, uh, availability of that output. I'm not saying that India does not have the potential I do not deny what he has been saying about the many things, uh, the power that we have, the ability that we have, the talents that we have. But all that I am saying is, all that looked brighter about 10 years ago, and they are somewhat looking dull now. We need to recapture that. I am not the one to be um, take a pessimistic view. But at the same time, uh, we have to accept the realities as they are at the particular moment. It's somewhat surprising that India is among one of the countries, few countries, whose output GDP will go down by 10%. There are not many countries, I mean, in the world, which, which are going to experience that. Therefore, there is really a need to really um, tie up 
and get on to becoming a real economic power. I agree about many of the suggestions that he made, many of the comments that he made on digitization and so on and so forth. All that are essential. But I do believe there are two things that we should really make it possible, make it, uh, uh, make it uh, or prerequisites. One, we need a prudent financial system. We need a, a, a financial market system, uh, which is capable of supporting uh, the uh, growth momentum. And secondly, I think if you, had, uh, if you look at the numbers as far as India is concerned, uh, the steep decline in the savings ratio and the investment ratio in the last 10 years, I'm talking almost from 10, 11, it started, the, is, is also coming in the way of rapid economic growth. Therefore, two things that we really need to do is try to raise uh, the investment ratio of the economy and mm. also try to ensure uh, that the financial system is prudent and capable of providing the wherewithal for the economy uh, to grow. All that I am saying is that in order for us to get to the point where Professor Seth says we should be, we should be, I think there are a number of things that we really need to take into yeah. um, um, take take on. We have talked about education. We have talked about uh, instilling the spirit of science, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, the economic growth of the country uh, depends to a large extent upon raising the investment ratio in the country and yeah. energizing the country in order to get back to the high level of economic growth. If we just look at the numbers of between 2005, 6, and let's say even up to 2008, 9, or 2019. In fact, India was not affected by the crisis for the next two years, two, up to 2019, when we had a rate of growth of 8% plus, it was a high investment rate that really facilitated. I believe the reforms are important, and he rightly emphasized the big difference that the new um, <coughs> um, uh, idea makes a difference for the License Raj. Obviously, it is correct. I think the License Raj would not have enabled us even to come where we are at the present a movement. But we need to take the reform agenda forward. We need to apply the spirit of liberalization as much as possible to every area and every segment of the Indian economy, combine it with a high level of investment. And then, of course, have the necessary talent, build the talent, and so on and so forth. So I agree that India has the potential to be what he calls the triad. And I do believe that we must keep that as an, as an ambition. But I really think that it will take some more time to achieve that, because I, I, I think the at the present state uh, uh, the, of, the, of the economy uh, is not very convincing. I think we really need to uh, really move faster and the, get the rate of growth uh, as quickly as possible to 8% or 9% per annum. The, uh, of course, 2021-22, we may get 8% because we are uh, going from minus 10%. But we need to grow at a sustained rate of growth uh, <clears throat> uh, of 8%. I had made the calculation at one particular point. If India used to be classified as a higher income country or a developed economy, that is, that is always defined in terms of the per capita income, it requires almost 15 to 18 years for India to grow at 8% per annum. That's the, that's the kind of uh, mandate uh, that is before us. And therefore, I, I would say that the issues that Professor Seth raised are very relevant. 
I think India must shed inhibitions and must move forward. But the, the immediate question really is to ensure that the rate of growth of the economy picks up fast. Unless and until India becomes a strong economic power, to talk in terms of yeah. being a strong political power is out of question. Even a military power, the military power also depends upon how strong the economy is. Therefore, the things to be done are very clear. The, the need for uh, a, an education system, uh, the need for, uh, as I said, the scientific temperament and so on. All that is important. And we really need to get the economy moving fast. Yes, the point really is that somebody raised the question about inequality and poverty and so on. The country has still between 20 and 30% of the population below the poverty line. And therefore that is a very large number. My committee estimated it at 30% and another committee estimated it at 20%. So it all depends upon where you draw the line. But certainly, I, I think the rate of growth of the economy is extremely important in order to be able to um, get the people out of poverty. We cannot be called an economic power or a political power with 20% of the people uh, uh, below the, the, the poverty line. And for that to happen again, the rate of growth of the economy has to be of the order of 8 to uh, 9%. So that is what I, I, I think uh, we should be moving towards. And I only do hope that, that the Western world and the developed countries will move away from direction in which some of them are moving, like um, uh, really curbing the free trade, curbing international trade, and so on and so forth. These are wrong uh, direction in which some people or some countries are moving. Um, in the final analysis, free trade, or perhaps I should put it free and fair trade, goes to improve the prosperity of every nation. And that is one thing in which the developed countries can help developing countries or uh, the, uh, the, uh, the emerging economies like India to reach their uh, potential. So we need to enable India to achieve its potential. India has the talent. India has the materials. India has, of, of course, some of the um, right ideas also. Therefore, if we can combine all of that, we can get where Professor Seth wants us to get. And I only do hope that his optimism will be contagious and all of us will be in a position to be able to move forward. Thank you very much once again, Professor Seth, for a very interesting and uh, very pointed lecture this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for your excellent uh, uh, concluding remarks. And now uh, we have come to the end. I request the registrar, uh, Professor Vijay Lakshmi, to propose a word of thanks. Yes, sir. Very good evening to all of you. So, on behalf of IFHE, I want to thank our beloved Professor, Professor Jagdish Seth, for his very enlightened and very interesting and so much of learnings are there in his speech. And I want to thank our beloved Chancellor, Dr. C. Rangarajan, former governor, RBA, for his excellent analysis and a lot of takeaways are there in his uh, uh, analysis also. And I want to thank Madam Shobharani Yashishvi for her uh, gracious presence in this particular lecture. And I want to thank uh, uh, all the professors, uh, directors, advisors, uh, as well as all the senior professors and uh, senior colleagues also, uh, almost 98 people attended. I want to thank by name to each and everybody for attending this lecture. 
and make it very interesting. Thank you, Ben and all, and good night to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes the session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Seid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Seid. Thank you, sir. Professor Dangaraj. Thank you. 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 Excellent. Thank you, sir. Concluding remarks. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Professor Steve. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Bye. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. मीटिंग सर चपंडी